New media, new times, new academics. A podcast between Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'd like to welcome you to this rather special podcast. It is a standalone podcast, but it is involving my recurrent partner in crime, Professor Steve Redhead, who we accidentally sort of like live together and stuff as well. So that's why he's so available to discuss the issues and matters of the day. And the topic we want to talk about this week involves thinking about new media, new times and new academics. And the trigger for this podcast was, interestingly enough, I was talking with a a PhD student this week who had written a journalism article and it was fantastic and it got picked up a bit. And he was after some pretty rapid advice about how to handle radio, how to really facilitate and build on the little bit of profile and momentum that he was getting to render it more long lasting. And that was a really great question. And in fact, I'll construct a podcast dealing with more overt how-to strategies. But before I got to the sort of how-to podcast, I thought I'd deploy Steve and get Steve to talk through how academic staff make choices when considering the correct fit between their professional lives, the stage of their career, and the media that they choose to convey that information. So it is very important, I think, that we all just don't do everything in the new media environment, but we select the new media that is appropriate for who we are and is appropriate for the type of information audience we're trying to reach and also the stage of our career. So hello, Steve. Hello. Now, let's go back in time, shall we, young man? Uh, Fifteen years ago, Steve, before we were married, if there was even a period before we were married, but I think there was, but 15 years ago, Steve, you used email and you used the internet uh, for relatively straightforward research and for searches, but again, that's what we all did 15 years ago. So what do you now use and why? Yes, famously in our family, uh, I I am told that when we first met physically in uh, Perth, Western Australia, 14 years ago, uh, that you had actually looked online to see if I had a profile. Well, a picture, so I could see what you looked like. Yeah, and there was no picture and there was no profile and you had to go to porn sites to find Redhead. Can I just clarify, not that you're on a porn site, but when we searched Steve and Redhead... Uh, listeners can imagine the searches that I got. Lots of Steves very interested in lots of redheads. So please continue, Steve. But that is a famous story and a true story in our family. (laughs) But I did have a big old media profile in the sense that I'd done a lot of newspaper interviews, newspaper articles, uh, radio and TV interviews in the early part of my career. And by the time... We met, and by the time I actually came to Australia, to emigrated to Australia 13, 14 years ago, and that old media profile was dying in a way. I had done a lot, but uh, it wasn't really uh, seen anywhere, so you couldn't pick it up on the internet. So that's important, if I can pause there. So this big analogue profile, books, refereed articles in high-quality journals, BBC documentaries, news, front covers of Newsweek, etc., that enormous analogue profile, rave off, etc., was not being transposed digitally in the way that you expected or had hoped. And also, I probably didn't care about it. I I just not really cultivated. It just happened to me accidentally. But I realised pretty quickly that in the new era, which was about the turn of the the century, turn of the millennium, um, that a new profile for my own work, could actually be developed if I got off my arse and did something about it. Yeah. Um, in, in a way that I could use and could benefit from in, a, in an academic way. And I think that was the interesting thing, that I, I did then, partly at your behest, start my own personal website, and then I did another one. And I'm actually reconstructing uh, at the, as we speak, partly in order to refresh that profile, but also to think how I could use uh, 
um, the global audience for my work in a different way. So I've really had to think very carefully and very specifically about it recently. But I did think about it 13, 14 years ago, and I'm glad I did do what I did. Um, and I started um, to benefit from having a website and contact with people that, particularly I wasn't meeting physically anymore because I was mainly in Australia at that time and I'm now in, uh, permanently in Australia again. So I think that's been very important for me. Um, and of course, I've continued to use email to use the internet in general. But then I did start to use, uh, I use YouTube. So we did a YouTube thing that I did on Virilio, for example. Just as the book was starting to get an audience. Which, which yes. was quite interesting. It was, that, it was a photo story. So I was using, uh, again, different kinds of media and social media. Um, Academia.edu, though, what I call Facebook for Academics, started to really take off perhaps about three or four years ago, and I got involved in that. And now I find that that in particular is a really good vehicle uh, I tell all my postgraduate students to get on there because they can really contact a lot of people who would they would normally not have any contact with around the world. And some of the um, numbers of connections, numbers of hits, are just absolutely astonishing. Um, for some reason, a piece that I've written on, which, which is actually on, in draft, uh, on the firm, which is the study of 400 football hooligan gangs which is long-term research that I've directed at different universities is actually now it's up to something like 8,500 hits for one draft paper it's a draft paper and the actual the original is going to come out in Sporting Society next year but this is a draft and it hit, gets hits uh, you know overnight hits which are in the in the hundreds, but actually about 8,500 people have hit that well look let's break down and go to academia.edu yep. if we can specifically because, you know, I've been on there a long time, you've been on there a long time. In fact, we were some of the earliest academics that went on it. I picked it early as being something important. And the template, their platform has improved and become more specific and interesting. In fact, they've even had an upgrade in the last three, four months where the data that they're giving writers is more exacting. Mm. So, you know, let, let's start with that and talk about academia.edu. Uh, if you're an academic, if you're an early career researcher, you must be on that. I, I think believe. so. And now, why? Well, I, I think um, because it's a really important growing social network where people can share information. Um, I was on an interview panel this week and two of the four candidates mentioned academia.edu and mentioned that they'd seen my work on academia.edu, for example. One person was was from Brazil, one per person was from Canberra. So I think it, it, it's that's a graphic illustration of the current uh, of the current currency of academia.edu. But uh, the way I use it is quite uh, diverse now. For example, I put put talks on there with the actual academic text and references of my talks, which wouldn't appear anywhere else. Just for example. No. They're all shared, um, and I can do the same with other people that I'm uh, on the network with. Uh, I've put a lot of my 70-odd podcasts on there as well. I've noticed that they've really gone quite well. You can freely download them, yeah. no problem. Uh, the same with papers, and I've used... I mean, even just overnight, for example, I've put a couple of papers up yesterday, which are recent drafts of work which is eventually going to be published. But people that I know in the UK got in touch with me overnight and said they'd really enjoyed reading it, and we had a kind of banter actually on another social media platform, Twitter. But it was about the stuff on academia.edu. And also my 15 books that I've published all have some kind of reference, sometimes literally the reference to the e-book or whatever it is, on academia.edu and I, I've been astonished at the growth of it and the importance of it. It really has become Facebook for academia. Now it's important, let's break that down a little bit. So Steve and I tend to use academia.edu a bit differently. I use it as an online CV so I only upload my finished refereed articles, books. I also put my podcasts and YouTube videos up as well but I put the finished because I have open access journals, I have the finished article up there. Steve has been using the drafts incredibly well. I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't share drafts, but that's just me. Steve is, and doing it incredibly well, and having incredible momentum for 
his research. Steve, let's just go back to a second to that amazing article on the Hooligan memoirs mm. that, you know, has got thousands. I mean, I think it is like in the top two or three cited, found articles on the entire academy.edu so, site. Yeah, top five, and five percent you've, so. you've had uh, article requests come from that, and indeed sort of books yep. featuring your work coming from the guaranteed viewed profile of that single page. I have, yeah. And I think the point about the drafts, I think, mm. um, which I, I was always a bit reluctant to do as well, but one of my post assistants, uh, who was also reluctant to go on academia.edu... Can I just say a big shout-out to, to Ian? Ian Cunningham, um, who I, I you know, got great respect for, and I, th- and, and I respected his privacy to do with that. But I think he's actually said that he's benefited from that. And he asked me, you know, what about intellectual property? You know, will journals allow you to put the things on there? And one of the reasons why I've tended to adopt drafts, pretty late drafts, but but uh, different versions, is that because I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of Virilio City of the Instant, you know, I am interested in, in work getting out now and me reading other people's work now. Whereas actually with the slowness of, say, academic journals and particularly books, you're going to be months, even years, before you see this work. And I think that the idea of getting a draft, a pretty, you know, finished draft, if you like, out, and then you get discussion with other people on academia.edu about that work, particularly if it's cutting-edge stuff, I think that's really quite important. So I've used it in that way for all sorts of reasons, but partly because I did want to get my work out uh, and get it discussed and get some feedback in a particular way. And I found academia.edu really interesting for that, from that point of view. But I, like Ian Cunningham, was actually really reluctant to start it. I feel like I'm a pretty private person, and I've always been concerned about uh, internet profile and the kind of slagging that people get, the bullying, sexism and the racism and so on. I really am very concerned about those things and particularly when I started some of these things my own website or academia.edu I was extremely reluctant but I'm glad that I did enter the fray Um, and I think you have to be just careful how you use it. I agree and also how I convinced you Steve and indeed how I convinced Ian as well because he came into my office and said oh I don't know and actually how I convinced him is the way you, you you've got to manage yes. your digital self. Yes. So it, it, you know people will say bad things about you, analog or digital, mm. anyway. But if you actually have control, so I said to Steve, let's get control of steveredhead.com, steveredhead.zone in this case. Yeah. So we've gone through the web and got control of all those things. Yes. So you are able to construct the originating discourse to which others can respond. But for listeners who are perhaps of Steve's seniority, and there are many of you out there, hello, uh, do you notice also that he's put those analogue books that had such a huge profile in the proto-Web2 age, he's linked that to academia.edu. So those analogue materials now have a digital life. So he's connected Mm. those components of his career up. The other thing I would say, and I don't know if you use academia.edu in this way, Steve, but I do, I have particular specialist areas of interest, like, for example, QR codes Mm. is a great example. But I have all sorts of weird and interesting interests, third-tier cities and so forth. Mm. And you can actually set up a whole series of reminders or or notifications when a new piece on these very specialist topics start to emerge. Wouldn't work as well, say, with criminology or Mm. teacher education because there are so many. But if you've got these very specialist Mm. interests... And actually, this is how I convinced Ian as well about the value of it, because I put his specific search term in, and all of a sudden there were 200 articles he'd never heard of. Again, just published. So it's that city of the instant stuff again. Fascinating. So useful. That's academia.edu. Now, you've already mentioned Twitter a little bit. Mm. Your engagement with Twitter is, is, is very odd and very interesting, and it is transforming. You're, again, using it in interesting ways. What do you see as the function of and for Twitter for academics? I've always described Twitter as a pointer to richer resources, but you're using it in different ways. Yes, I mean, I feel like, a bit like a ball bearing in in it all. I'm not sure that... When I first started on Twitter, you know, I, I had one tweet which was about Virilio and the uh, Japanese tsunami, I think, and that was all that there was for for months. And very common, by the way, Twitter often starts very slow, guys and girls, yeah. But I suddenly realised, partly because I was using Virilio, that um, actually this 
was something that I could double back on theoretically and really self-reflexively think about. And also somebody like Virilio and the, many of the other theorists I was using who are so cryptic and so good at aphorisms, they fitted 140 characters so well. Yeah. But also I think I'm starting to find again how the city of the instant thing is working. Even a few days ago I got... Um, contacted by people in the UK who are interested in, in, in uh, me submitting a chapter for a new book, which they're on doing, Twitter, they which looks absolutely terrific. Twitter. And in fact, they contacted me on Twitter, and by, I, I think I got it about six o'clock New South Wales time. By the time I got to work, uh, we'd started to email each other about links between our respective universities. <laughs> and I think this that that was amazing. That And in fact, you know, People involved had actually looked at each other's work on academia.edu, oh my interestingly, for, the data for quite a long time. Yeah. But I think that is a great example. And very often um, people are using Twitter in that way, just simply contacting people out of the blue. Yeah. And there's a, that's a great example. That's going to be very productive when it comes from Twitter. But I also think um, you have to have some sort of strategy. So, for example... Uh, I'm part of the National Rural Law and Justice Alliance um, at the moment, and I'm a council member. I'm I'm helping to organise their um, third annual conference, which is going to be at Charles State University in 2015. And they have a Twitter account, just for example. And when you're involved in an organisation like that, which is really trying to raise its profile, to raise money and so on, you can see how important that is. you know, on a daily basis. And I think it's the same for universities and for individual academics. Yes, very, very well said. It has that connectivity. And also, for again, for the guys and girls of, of Steve's seniority, it's another way to bring back all those people and all that profile you had during the analogue age. Because, you know, Steve's and my profile are different. Generationally, we're a little bit different. But I've noticed with Steve... All of a sudden, people that you know you knew 15, 20 years ago have rediscovered you, have found you, and that just beyond excited to have found you. So the accessibility of Twitter via academia.edu and then via email is really bringing back those analog elements of your career through digital speed. Yeah, very, very much so. I think that's a good way of putting it. I've found the same. I'm rediscovering people's work that I, I physically knew. 15, 20 years ago. But I actually think it's it's interesting how different the situation is to when I first emigrated to Australia 13, 14 years ago. Yeah, web one, web two. I do think this is now different in, in such a way that we really have shrunk time and space. I didn't think so at the time 13, 14 years ago, although everybody said they were doing it. But actually, I think that the new media technologies have changed. And I use all sorts of other... Th- um, you know, social media and new media technologies like Skype, for example, to be examiner. So there are all kinds of ways that you are reconnecting in the city of the instant, which was probably a theoretical thing 13, 14 years ago, but actually is a practical reality now. Yeah, deterritorialization and yep. deintermediation yep. have happened, they are, are actioned, and they, they are, are now real. real. Yeah. I dragged you, kicking and screaming, can I say, podcast listeners, to podcasts. We've used them. In fact, we, I, my first podcast were with you in Brighton, I think, where we configured a new genre called micro-interviews, where yep. I asked one question, often definitional, like what was post-youth culture, yep. and I then played that in a lecture or I put that on, say, a Blackboard or a Moodle profile. And that was very successful. And I think we've configured some very interesting academic genres or oeuvres through podcasts. We've also used them, as podcast listeners know, for doctoral education, for research to help guys and gals think about publishing. So now that you have been dragged kicking and screaming to podcasts and you're now at 50, 60, 70 podcasts, what do you consider their value to be now, good sir? Yes, I was very sceptical. You're absolutely right. Partly because I thought sounds you know the sonic scene was actually a reversal and in fact of course it was futuristic um i'd I'd been so interested in the visual that i couldn't understand why um something his missus was obsessive with the machine that goes ping yeah basically Um, but of course you were right and uh, it is now (laughs) a completely different i have a completely different attitude to it and i've used it in those years for my teaching uh, for my work as a sub-dean or as associate dean, I've, I've really, really benefited personally from it. 
And also the idea, that whole idea of, you know, mobility, that you're actually able to listen to things on the move. Um, we all have such mobile lives, and I, I do think that's incredibly important. Um, and I also think that, I suppose what we're doing now, the conversational style of podcasts is really interesting to me. I've done hundreds and hundreds of radio interviews in my career, um, and it was something that I had no media training about. I had to learn, um, and I learned on the job, basically. But I've always been interested in the idea of you know, the sound interview, yeah. and I think it re- really does work very, very well, and podcasts are... You know, they've opened up a whole new arena for me and for my work. And we might just talk about Theoretical Times, the podcast Theoretical Times. We've now done, I think it is four, it might five, be five. No, five and we're right, we're yeah. going to Alders Air shortly. I'm doing yeah. the prep for that this week. But again, that's a great example. On Twitter, these guys and gals had heard your Theoretical Times podcast. So do you want to talk about the profile of those particular podcasts and the impact of those podcasts on your research work. Yeah, I'm astonished by the um, by the way in which those have gone and yeah. the downloads and the interest around the world. I think what, one of the things about uh, the Theoretical Times Project when I first started it was that I didn't really know where it was going to go. And I thought I had something there. And it, it did develop in my work. And I used it for... for um, for writing articles and uh, and so on, but it was only really when we did podcasts on it and I got feedback that this was something that people were interested in globally and on such a scale that I suddenly realised I'd stumbled across something that was really much more interesting than my original idea uh, and and much more long lasting. And it made me go back to the to these theories actually and work much harder on them. Some of them I, I knew a lot about. Some I knew less about it. I've had to really work hard and work up papers and essays which are now being written, which is great. And it just made me concentrate on the essence of that work. And I think the the podcasts are a major vehicle in that. They weren't just a major vehicle in getting the work out. And I think they've helped in doing that. You could actually almost publish them as e-books. But they've now made me concentrate Whereas, whereas I was probably, you know, not really very focused about it. It's made me really work on it. Um, and it, that's all from the podcast. And what I would say, listeners, and again, if you're listening to this podcast, the chances are you heard the Theoretical Times podcast. I worked very hard to push Steve. Steve didn't know what I was going to ask him. And I really tried to push him. So it was interesting. My great friend, my great colleague, Janine McCarthy, who's the office manager in the School of Teacher Education, had heard those. And she used the amazing description that it it felt like I was in the middle of a graduate seminar Mm. between two people having a dialogue about this theorist. So these podcasts have been able to capture some pretty high-level work. I think I've come up with the phrase something like complex ideas through conversation. Mm. That's a brilliant description. And and you were pushed. Because the thing is, Steve, it's very hard at your level of seniority, unless you are pushed, you know, you're brilliant, you're doing brilliant work, how do you improve? And in some ways, the podcast and the feedback you get from it is a strategy for you to think about new ideas in new ways. It definitely was, and it worked, because I had to go back to the text, interestingly enough, of the theorists that I was writing about and then speaking about, um, which made me realise I didn't know enough. So I had to be pushed, not only, I suppose, to engage in the conversations in the first place, but actually to really revise the work that I was doing. Because I think sometimes, you know, because we work in such isolated ways anyway, the whole point about the connection through social media, although sometimes that can be difficult, you're being pushed into something you don't want to do. But actually, I think that idea, I mean, certainly uh, in in my future career, I, I see myself as having all of these connections without necessarily having to travel. And I quite like the idea of not having to travel and being able to just get on with my work. Yeah. But actually, you've got huge connections now through all of the social media we're talking about, which you never had before. And it, you know, the whole idea of actually publishing, say, an article in a journal or publishing a book, and academic books don't sell very well, um, you know, was always a bit limiting anyway. You know, how many people were really uh, engaging with that work? Suddenly... You know, I feel I've got an audience which is really making me think and work 
uh, on a global scale that I've never had before. And I do think that's down to social media. If I was an early career researcher now, I would engage with this in a massive way. I think you absolutely cannot dip out of it. Yeah. And, and it could help in all sorts of unforeseen ways. I think there are problems... But as long as you manage your profile, as you said before, mm. I think there's there's great possibilities. And I hope, again, senior colleagues, and we'll get to early career researchers in our last question, Steve, but I hope senior colleagues are hearing these words and realising if they have a project that they're working on, they have a book or a big ticket item that they're working on, and they do feel a bit stale or maybe that it's not going where they want it to be or they would like an infusion of new ideas to create that momentum, a podcast could be a way to do it, to talk through the challenges with a scholar who actually understands those issues and pushes you a little bit, then it, you know, a very interesting series of ideas can emerge. So the, the last question is about senior colleagues, but it's also about our early career researcher, our guys and gals, but also mid-career researchers get, that get left out of the party all the time. What advice would you offer all our colleagues when they're thinking about social media? What's the take-home story here, Steve? Well, certainly I think all of them, whatever pe stage people are at, my argument now would be that you can't afford uh, to dip out of it. So you take, you know, pick and mix, use as much uh, and where you want to use it, but you cannot dip out of it. That's my view. So profile is incredibly important. So personal websites with blogs or whatever... Um, using platforms like Twitter or, or whatever other examples you like, YouTube, using Skype more for um, for conversations globally. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an interconnectivity which we've never really globally uh, satisfied in academia. And I do think that's now, we're on the verge of that. Um, we've said we've been on the verge of it before. So that this is this is a new time. It's a new year in this sense. I mean, I think some of the libertarian claims for these sorts of things are a bit over the top. And I know it's recently one of the theorists that I've used in theoretical time, Slavoj Žižek, starts to talk about uh, the internet and all the sorts of freedoms that he sees uh, globally as some kind of neo-communism. Uh, I think... You know, you have to be really careful about this. But I do think there is some real value in academics at whatever stage of their careers now, particularly people like postgraduate students, uh, getting involved. You know, it didn't cost anything, yeah. as uh, my mother-in-law says. <laughs> and also, Steve, for, I'll, I'll just use as an example visual scholars as well. Areas we haven't gone, to, gone into as strongly but may do in the future, Instagram, for example, yeah. or Pinterest. Yes. I've used Pinterest I tend to use Pinterest, which is sort of like the online pinup board, mm. to find data. I use them. Yes. I don't use them to produce stuff and send it out into the world. I again, whether I'm looking for QR codes or or doing my Doctor Who research or whatever, mm. I, the visual scholars have these yes. other fantastic platforms yes. to use as well. Do you see any difference, though, Steve, between what a senior scholar such as yourself would do compared to say an early career researcher? Are there differentials with regard to the senior seniority of the scholar? No, I don't think so, really. And uh, I think what's blocked a lot of senior scholars, actually, is the idea that you know the internet is basically to do with digital natives, which is a load of nonsense. Yes, Prinsky was wrong, so seriously wrong. So yeah. I think there is no real reason why this should affect people differentially. Um, but everybody needs to be involved in, in a personal way. I think they need to personally manage it, as you've said. Well said, Steve. Thank you so much for this conversation. This is important, guys, and I just hope for the for the men and women out there who are interested in having a go that this podcast may be a way to just calm them down a bit and have a think about the potential. For the guys and girls who are already active on Facebook or academia.edu, it may create new ways for you to use it that perhaps you hadn't considered. But, yeah, have a go. And I'm not sure if it creates new academics, but I'm certain that it creates new audiences for academic work. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast titled New Media, New Times, New Academics. If you'd like to talk to Steve Redhead or Tara Brabazon to discuss these matters further, please email us at Charles Sturt University.